Hi, my name is Jonathan Clerk, uh, also known as DJ Bolivia. This is part two of my mobile DJing video. Now when I started to film this video I thought I'd be able to put it all together into one long video and I didn't realize until I started editing that I had to cut it up into two different pieces because it's too long. Okay, so if you haven't watched the first video yet, I'll put a link here on the screen right now. You might want to go watch that first before you watch this half of the video which is all about the gear. The first, uh, first video I talked about like the business end of things, licensing, insurance, marketing, the type of events that you'd be getting into, um, signing contracts, setting rates, deposits, um, knowing your competitors, all sorts of stuff like that, okay? So if you haven't watched that yet, check it out first, then come back and watch this one, okay? At this point, I'll assume you've already seen the other one, so let's get started. Okay, so let's talk about bass bins. Um, bass bins, also known as a subwoofer, and basically it's a speaker that's designed um, specifically to, to broadcast the lower frequencies in a song. Um, so usually what'll happen is you'll have a bass bin or two bins, uh, or two subwoofers, and then you'll have separate speakers called the tops or the mains, which carry all the mid-range and the higher frequencies in a song, okay? So the bass bin, obviously the bass frequencies, they're the thumping frequencies. Um, when, you're, when you're listening to a song, most of the signal coming out of a bass bin is going to be kick drum and the lower notes on a bass guitar. Okay, so this one, this one is a, it's an example of a powered subwoofer. So there's two types of subwoofers, there's powered and unpowered. A powered one is going to be more expensive, but the reason for that is because inside it, it has an amplifier, and you need an amplifier to power the sound coming out of the speaker. So if you have an unpowered subwoofer, you're going to have to own or use a separate amplifier, which is going to be, you know, it's, it's going to be part of your setup. Now the reason I like the powered, uh, powered subwoofers is because it's an all-in-one solution. It's a lot easier moving this around, knowing that the amplifier is in it, than to take a se separate amplifier that, uh, that you have to worry about setting up separately. And amps can be a little bit finicky. Um, you have to worry about heating issues. You have to worry about ventilation, um, stuff getting spilled on them, knocked on them, whatever. So it's way better to have the amp inside the speaker if you can do that. With this particular subwoofer, um, this is a Yorkville. It's called the Elite LS801P. It's, uh, it's a Canadian brand, so it's produced in Canada. On the front, you can look through the mesh and you can see the size of the subwoofer speaker. This is an 18 inch speaker, pretty standard for a good subwoofer. Um, inside it, the amplifier is a 2500 watt power amplifier. It says that this is a 1500 watt active subwoofer enclosure. So basically what happens is the amp inside this, you don't want to match the amp size to the speaker output because to be able to use the speaker at the full, full levels, you're going to be pushing your amp to the very top of its capability. So what happens is they've got a much stronger amp inside this than the speaker needs and that way the amp is not working as hard as it would have to otherwise. Okay, so this produces about, at peak output, continuous output, it produces about 134 decibels SPL. That's a measurement of the volume of the sound just out in front of the speaker. That's tons of volume, that's way too loud. That's much more than you would ever need. Um, basically, the um, because it's designed to handle the low end frequencies, this particular type of subwoofer, this particular model, uh, basically plays everything from 45 hertz up to 150 hertz. And so if you understand the sound uh, frequency spectrum, you can tell that's a pretty narrow tight range, but that's going to handle the low end of bass guitar notes and it's going to handle a lot of the kick drum stuff. Now it's interesting that this doesn't really do anything below 45 hertz because a lot of uh, producers in dance music are really worried, um, well not a lot, but some are worried about the, the very low ends like 20 hertz to 30 hertz. 
it's kind of uh, irrelevant in a lot of situations because, you know, this is a pretty good subwoofer. In a lot of places that you're going to be playing music, um, whether it's a club, a home, um, a professional venue, um, your truck, whatever, most speakers don't necessarily handle the frequencies way down that low. So anyway, anything below 45, not really uh, useful. So what's going to happen is you are feeding a signal into this subwoofer and there's a couple different ways that this can happen. This particular subwoofer and a lot of them will accept two different types of signals. The first is a speaker level signal and so that would be the signal coming out of an external amplifier and the second option is a line level signal so that would be the same standard signal um, intensity, energy level, as coming out of a CD player or coming through a DJ mixer, coming out of the back end of a CD, uh, of a DJ mixer. So now I said that there's a, there's an amplifier in here. So why would someone feed a signal from a, an external amplifier to go into this? Doesn't really make sense, does it? Um, well, it doesn't, really makes sense. It doesn't happen as often. The preferred approach is to take a line level signal into this. If you are feeding a speaker level signal into this, the reason that's there, it's, it's kind of a backup option because in some installations that might be the best option on what's available coming to where this speaker is going to be placed. But the thing is, I believe what this particular um, bin does is it takes that speaker level signal reduces it to line level, and then it feeds that line level signal as if it was a normal line level signal, feeds it into the internal amplifier and reamplifies it. So effectively, no matter which of the two types of signal you're feeding in, you're still using the internal amp in this. But of course, if you start off with speaker level, reduce it and then reamplify it, you're gonna have a little bit more noise in your signal. It's not gonna be as clean, crisp um, sound. So your best option is to go with line level signal. Now, in theory, bass frequencies um, can be anywhere in the stereo field. So quite often what people will do is they'll set up two bass bins and basically your left and right will be coming out of your mixer and going into the two different bins. And so in theory, you've got a stereo image, stereo field coming out of your two different bass bins. In practice, it's very, very rare for musicians, producers, to have the, the low frequency stuff panned to the sides in any conventional music, dance music, rock, whatever. Um, it just doesn't happen as frequently. So most of the time, especially with dance music, if you've got two different bins set up, one is a left and one is a right, what's coming out of the two different bins, technically, is stereo, but effectively, it's probab probably going to be almost exactly the same. Usually, bass and kick drums will be panned to the center, so you'll hear the same thing roughly out of two sides. Now, are there exceptions to this? Of course. Um, if I were to think of a classic rock song, there's a song called Low Rider by War, and you're probably familiar with that. It's got that, um, that bass line, do 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 that at the beginning of the song if you listen to it carefully that's mostly panned to the right so if you have two bass bins most of the sound in that low end is only going to be coming out of one of them with this bass bin it's also possible to take your signal from your mixer combine it into a mono blend and then feed it into this so if that's the case uh, let's say you had that example of Lowrider's song, uh, of, uh, of the Lowrider song by War. You could, in theory, merge your stereo signal and send two copies of that out, one to each speaker. In which case, each one would be playing exactly the same thing, and each one would be playing half of the left and half of the right combined at the same time. So that's an option. Does this matter in most installations? Not really, because most of the time, the bass and the kick are centered in music.
Okay, so looking at some of the features on this, uh, it uses a standard plug here, uh, being designed in Canada. This one actually runs on 120 volts, so you would need an adapter in uh, Europe or any place that uses 210, 220, 240 volts. Uh, a lot of electronics these days, like small electronics, phones, tablets, laptops, stuff like that, cameras, those use um, power supplies that will work on either 110 to 120 or 210 to 240, um, but that's not the case with this. This particular one, only 120. Uh, it has a, it has a um, circuit breaker there, a fuse. Power supply or power switch on off switch. Okay, I kind of covered this stuff. There's a little recess button here that lets you pick whether the input is coming in as speaker level or or uh, line level. So I leave it out because normally I'm running in line level signals. Now my signal coming into this. There's a couple different options. If you are taking a signal straight out of a CD player, straight out of a mixer directly into this your sound coming into this is going to be a broad spectrum. Everything from the lows of, say, 20 hertz to the highs of, say, 20,000 hertz, 20 kilohertz. That broad signal, only a small part of it at the low end, is actually going to be played by this speaker. It's also possible, and I will talk about this in a minute when we get to crossovers, but it's also possible to use a piece of equipment called a crossover, which eliminates a lot of those high frequencies so it's mostly just the low end coming into this anyway. Either way will work. Now, we've got three knobs here. The first one, um, we can go down to, to negative infinity, so that means basically no volume. Standard, zero decibels, the level you should be running this at is right in the center, and you can boost up to 12 decibels above normal uh, levels. The shape, it's basically a very simple equalizer. Um, not a huge difference between the two. One of these settings is called loud and it uses a very curved standard thing for your range from 45 to 150. You can also set it to deep and what it does is the top end is normal and then there's a little bit of a boost down at the low end. The high frequency roll off can go from 90 to 150 if you've got it at 150, it means everything above 150 hertz is not coming through here. But if you want to have even more of just the low end, you can set this roll off to a different frequency down as far as 90. And if that's the case, if it's set to here, only the frequencies from 45 up to 90 will be coming through. Now, I don't know the exact specs on this roll off. I'm sure it's not, it, it can't be a cliff. It's going to be kind of a gradual roll off. So even down at 90, um, you know, it's probably maybe 12 decibels per octave as a roll off. So anything above 90 is going to be kind of attenuated in a gradual slope as you're getting to higher frequencies. But basically, subwoofer plays the low end. And what will happen is this thing, if I have a pair of these set up, that's probably good for anything up to a cafeteria of five or 600 people. If I'm in a small venue with maybe 100 to 150 people, I could quite easily get away with just using one of these. Okay, so that's about it for the, uh, for the subwoofer. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the speakers that I'm using as my tops or my mains. Um, this is an EV speaker. EV stands for Electro Voice. It's, a, it's an American company, I think based in Indiana maybe. Um, they sell these things all over the world. Um, so this one actually will take uh, voltages for the different systems. It'll take 110 to 120, it'll take 210 to 240. Um, anyway, so this speaker, this is used for the higher frequencies most of the time. Now this speaker will play back frequencies anywhere from about 50 to 60 hertz at the low end, right up to 19 or 20,000 hertz at the high end. So this can be used as a speaker by itself without my subwoofers, and it will cover the general range of most audio. And I do that when I'm playing in a very small um, location, um, not, not necessarily DJing, but this is good if you're 
I don't know, say you're in a room at an auction or whatever and they need some music for 15 minutes in an intermission, so you could pipe music and um, microphone and everything through this and that would work fine. But if I'm using it as a DJ installation, I'm probably going to instead use this as the top and pair it with a subwoofer. So what's going to happen is even though this will play frequencies down around 50 to 60 hertz at the low end, uh, it's more uh, appropriate to be using this for about 100 hertz and above, which is why in a bigger venue I would use the subwoofer for that low stuff from say 50 to 100, 120 hertz and then use this for the stuff from say 100 or 120 up to the very highest trebles. Okay, this particular one has a, um, it's got a 15 inch woofer inside, so it will play the low end, um, but I think of this as sort of more of a mid-range speaker, even though it can do the low ends. And it also has a small two inch driver, and the two inch driver is kind of like a tweeter, I guess. Um, so that'll play the really high frequencies. This 15 inch horn will play, um, it, it's rated at 1000 watts. The tweeter is rated at 250 watts. And the reason for that, think back to the bass bins uh, being 1500, they work well in tandem because as you're playing higher frequencies, you need less uh, power to, to drive the sound out. So that's why it's only 250 for this, 1000 for this, and 1500 for the, uh, for the subwoofer. So turning around to look at this on the back end, this is, uh, the model is a ZX-A5. Uh, it's a powered speaker, and inside it, the amplifier is a 1250 watt amp. So once again, more power to the amp than is necessary, so you're not pushing your amp very hard to uh, get the speaker um, sounding good. Uh, it's powered, so it uses, um, this is called a speak-on attachment, and uh, basically it clicks and locks into place, so that's what the power is. Then we've got our power button. Uh, we have our line level input through an XLR cord. Um, it will also take a quarter inch cord in the center there if you needed to. And this can work as a pass through, so you can feed your signal in through this and have it come out and go to a second speaker. Um, up here is our volume. And yeah, so it's generally a pretty good speaker. Um, it's nice and loud. Um, yeah. Now if I'm, because normally your tops, you're going to have the two of them and they're going to be set, one is your left and one is your right. And so you are going to get a very significant stereo sound out of having the two of these. So you have to think about your placement. You don't want to have the two of them sitting right side by side in the venue. If, if it's possible, you want them spread out so you can actually take advantage of that stereo sound. Um, you can, in some situations, it would be possible for you to feed your signal out of your DJ mixer and go into one of these and then out and down to your subwoofer. But it makes more sense to use a crossover, which again I'll talk about in a few minutes. And so your, your upper end of your signal is coming into this directly, into two, two of them as a stereo thing. And then just your low frequencies going into your subwoofer. Okay, and then for the bottom of this, it fits on a speaker pole, and what I usually do is have this sitting on top of my bass bins. Um, one, one characteristic about low frequencies with a bass bin, it's okay if they're on the ground, um, because say you've got a bunch of people dancing, the low frequency waves propagate through a crowd of people, through around obstacles very easily. With higher frequencies, if you've got something in the way, it really, really blocks them and makes them sound less clear. So for clarity, it's better to have your mains, your tops, up high. And that way they're at kind of at people's heads levels, if you're in a dance crowd or higher. That way you get a good clear sound no matter where you are, even if you're going over top of a whole lot of people. Whereas for the subs it doesn't matter. Okay, so here's an example of a bass bin with a speaker sitting on top of it. And normally what we do is we don't put the speaker sitting directly on top of the bass bin because it's not very stable, someone could knock it over. So we've got this speaker stand. The bass bins usually all have a receptacle for a speaker pole. 
and most speakers, main speakers, will have a receptacle in the bottom, and so you can see this can't really fall over, although it does look a little bit unstable, it's, it's pretty safe. So looking at the back, this is our XLR cords, so this is one half of our stereo signal, either the left or right channel, coming from our mixer, or in a larger installation it's going to be coming from the compressor and the crossover and the EQ from those units. So in this case, I've got it running into the main speaker and then it's passing through and the signal also goes down to the bass pin. So the main speaker is going to be playing the mid-range and the high frequencies, the bass pin will be playing the low frequencies. Uh, some people recommend that you feed your, your uh, signal into the bass pin first and then through the bass pins, throughput, up into the main. Um, I would recommend, depending on your speakers, because some of the bins have, and some of the uh, tops treat things a little bit differently, normally they should all be uh, completely unaffected pass-through, but that's maybe not always the case. So try it with both different configurations, see which one sounds better to you, and, uh, and that's basically how that works. Now, as far as the power, this cord, it has an end on it. This is, um, this type of end is usually known as a speak-on cable. What it does is it locks into place, and so it can't come out easily. You can't wiggle it out unless you move the silver disconnector knob on the side of it. Now, because this is on a power cord, this is called a power con, like a power connector, and, uh, but it's the same concept as a speak-on cable. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is my monitor, which I use optionally to have inside the DJ booth or right beside me when I'm playing, so I can point the speaker directly at me from just a few feet away, and I can get a much better sense of what's going on out on the dance floor or out in the rest of the area that I'm playing to, because the main speakers that I've got set up are probably facing away from me towards the people that are dancing and so you know they could be 50 or 100 feet away in some cases and if that's the case then I can't really get a, as good a sense of what they're hearing so the powered monitor that I use can be beneficial at times. Now before I talk about this specific thing I do want to cover a little bit of terminology relating to power. Uh, this will only take about 60 seconds this is not critical for you to understand this in terms of mobile DJing, but this seems like a good time to, uh, to mention it. So, work. The amount of work that can be done um, relates to power. So power is an expression of the amount of work. So, depending on what system you're talking about, there's different ways of expressing power. So, I'm going to mention three different systems that are fairly similar electricity, sound, and for the third one I'll just use the amount of water going through a garden hose to kind of illustrate these in more layman's terms. Now for, for sound, the, the power expressed in terms of sound is called the sound power level and this is abbreviated as SWL and it's expressed in watts. And you probably already know that we've talked about the volume, um, which is the sound pressure level expressed in decibels. Okay, So sound pressure level, SPL, and sound work level, or sound power level, SWL, slightly different things. Okay, In electricity, or in these other systems, Basically, to determine your amount of work, you go your amount times your force, okay? So, let's start off with um, the water hose as the simple analogy. So, if you think of a hose, water going through it, the diameter of the hose is your amount. That's how big, how much water can, can fit through. And then you have to think about the pressure of the water, how much the tap is open. So, the pressure of the water is the force. And in this system, the amount multiplied by the force gives you the work, or the power. And that would be the total volume of water that comes out. In electricity, very similar. Electricity is just like water flowing through a hose, okay? So the amount is the amperage of the current. The force 
is the voltage, and then the work or power that's being generated is the amount of watts in the electrical system. When you're talking about sound, you're talking the same thing, amount multiplied by force equals work power. So the amount is the area, the force is the intensity, and then the work, the power, is the sound power level, or sound work level. Now, in sound pressure level, the amount that you measure depends on a lot of factors. In sound power level, sound work level, it's source dependent. Okay, so basically you're working, you're looking at this in terms of uh, the intensity of the sound hitting a certain spot where you're measuring, multiplied by the area that's being hit by the sound gives you the total sound work level, sound power level. Okay, so that's expressed in watts. A little bit confusing, I know, but uh, it's good to know because sometimes we talk about the wattage of a speaker and sometimes we talk about the decibels, which is a different measure, that's the volume at a particular point in space. Okay, so let's talk about this, uh, this particular unit. Um, like I say, you do not need to have a separate monitor. You can sometimes use just your dance floor speakers. And so if you're playing in small venues where you're going to hear the sound very well, and especially if you're not doing beat mixing or something that requires you to hear the sound very, very clearly, then you may not need to have this separate monitor. And that might be beneficial because that's going to save you some money. Um, this particular monitor cost me about $900 US. And of course you also have to think about having some cords to hook it up to your sound system. And you probably want to have a stand to put it on. So you're looking at $1,000 US. But, if you're going to do mobile DJing professionally, and you want to be able to hear clearly what's going on, this is very, very useful. So, this particular monitor, let's talk about it, and you don't have to get this monitor. In fact, a lot of you in different parts of the world are not going to be able to get this monitor, because it's produced in Canada. But, you'll be able to find something comparable. So, this one is produced by a company called Yorkville. It's called the NX55P. And it's important to know that the, uh, this NX55P is a discontinued model. I got this about three years ago. They don't make them anymore. The, they've upgraded them to the NX55P-2, which is a slightly better monitor. Anyway, this particular monitor, it's got two drivers in it. Uh, it has a 1200-watt amplifier inside. The rating is 50, or sorry, 500, 550 watts. Okay, again, coming back to the fact that you always want to have an amplifier that puts out more power than your speakers can handle, because that means the amp does not have to work as hard to produce the sound in the speakers. Okay, so 550 watt powered loudspeaker. Uh, effectively, this speaker, the SPL that it produces a meter away from the speaker, I believe is peaks at 131 decibels and the uh, maximum continuous sound pressure level is 125 decibels. That's very, very loud. This speaker is, is loud. Okay, so down here we have the power switch. Obviously it uses a standard power plug, power cord. Now, for inputs, um, this section, the balanced uh, quarter inches and XLRs, this is if you're hooking a bunch of these up together in a series. And this particular monitor um, has been designed so you can actually feed a signal into one of these from your sound system, and then you can daisy chain it, go into one and back out of it into the next, through up to six of these speakers. Okay, so that's useful. Now, over here, we have the line or CD inputs, and we have an XLR input for a microphone. So this, this monitor is also good if you, maybe not necessarily when you're mobile DJing, 
let's say you've just got a speaker and you want to be able to use a microphone, do some emceeing duty, stuff like that. It's also useful for that. Now, when I use this with my DJ setup, I use a long RCA cord, and at one end, we have two RCA plugs, and these will plug into my booth monitor output. And at the other end of the cord, same thing, RCAs, except that I have put two adapters on these, which go from the male RCA on the end of the cord to a female RCA adapter and turns them into a male quarter inch plug. And these are mono quarter inch plugs, which you can tell by the fact that there's a single line there. If there were two lines there, then it would be a tippering sleeve, uh, and that means that it's a, it carries a ser stereo signal. But instead, because they're not stereo, we have two of them two monos together will make the stereo. So if I plug this into my line or CD inputs and then the other end going out to my booth monitor output on my DJ mixer, that's how I get my sound signal coming into here. I can also plug a microphone, just a normal microphone going, going into this through an XLR cord and that will work. It's got the microphone preamp inside it to boost the signal up to be the equivalent of line level and that way the speaker can process the sound. Now this particular speaker is also interesting because you can have up to three of these speakers daisy chained together. Now remember a second ago I said you can have six of them daisy chained together. That's for an external sound source coming in if you want a wall of sound, but you can have three of these hooked up together, each of them with its own signal source coming in, say from three different CD players, three different computers, three different iPads, whatever, and also you can have up to three separate microphones, one going into each of one of your three speakers. So in a situation like that, you can have your three speakers standing on stands facing your audience, three separate people each holding their own microphone, and three separate sound sources. Maybe they've got phones or iPads and they're doing their own thing. And that signal, those signals from all six different sources of line level input will get shared back and forth between these three speakers if you loop them together with your other connections. So that's pretty handy. Um, maybe not so much for a DJing situation where you're just playing music as a DJ, but if you're a mobile DJ, you're going to definitely encounter some situations where you're doing other types of entertainment, emceeing, people speaking, stuff like that. So that's pretty handy for this thing. Okay, so going through the rest of the speaker, what have we got? We've got a power indicator, green light when it's uh, turned on. We've got a yellow light to indicate when the limiter, li internal limiter is kicking in. And we've got a red light to say when the signal that's coming in is, is distorting. We have an overall volume level. And I believe this probably, yes, that used to have a uh, knob on it, but obviously I've lost that. Um, we have the mixer on off when the mixer is the button when this button's depressed and turned on then that feature of sharing the signal between three different units um, with multiple microphones and, and line inputs that has to be pushed in for that to work um, also when that is pushed in you've got controls here for your treble amount and your bass amount going through the speaker okay and then finally down here we have the mic volume, which is the volume coming in through that signal, and we have the line or CD volume, which is what's coming in through there. And that way, if you're trying to balance a person's microphone output over top of music that's coming in through here, you can adjust the, the values of the two of those relative to each other to get a nice balance. Okay, so this is a really nice uh, speaker. I really like this. Um, Yorkville's replacement, the NX55P-2, 
Uh, the difference with that, it's a little bit uh, more robust in its construction. The cabinet's a little bit better. Uh, it has a 2000 watt internal amplifier and its uh, rated output is 1000 watts instead of 550. But it's about the same price as this one was several years ago, just under $1000. So, you know, that might be one if you're in North America and you have access to your fill equipment, that might be one that you'd consider looking at and at least compare that with the features of other types of speakers that you might uh, might also possibly choose. Okay, so, and then here is the, there's the front of it, so you can see what it looks like. Okay, the newer one, the, the Dash 2, the mesh frame on this is a little bit more open looking, so you can see the drivers inside a little bit more easily. Anyway, this is a typical booth monitor, and uh, it, it's very useful if you're going for a professional setup. Okay, so the next component, this uh, thing that I'm going to talk about now is the central core. It's the heart and soul, the brains of my entire DJ operation, my mobile DJ setup. Um, this probably is as valuable uh, in terms of purchasing it as everything else put together. Speakers, lights, cords, cables, stands, everything else. Because this is my mixer and my two CD players. Okay, so this is actually, before I get to those, I'm going to talk about this case. Um, this coffin case is one that I specially ordered online. Um, you have to, every, every CD player, even if you look at all the different Pioneer CD players that look like they're similar, um, they're all slightly different sizes and have different uh, locations for their feet and stuff like that. So when I ordered this, I had to know exactly which um, CD players I was going to be putting into this and which mixer I was going to be putting into this. And I actually ordered this for my CDJ 1000 CD players and then I upgraded to the 2000s and they didn't fit. So I had to use a, uh, a utility knife and cut out a little bit of the foam um, to rearrange the interior foam in the case to make my 2000s fit properly. But I could. Um, this uh, the company that makes this, they're called Case Makers, a North American firm, and I believe this case, if I remember correctly, was about six or seven hundred dollars, so they are definitely not cheap. But when you consider the value of the equipment inside them, you want something sturdy to carry your stuff around in and to protect it. And the neat thing about this case is it's well designed to be used um, as, as a setup. You don't necessarily want to take your gear out of it when you're playing a show. So, uh, I can't actually show you right now, um, I'll, I'll do a clip in a second, um, that shows you the bottom of this, and it's pretty slick because the panel, the bottom panel comes off, and there's two folding legs that will plop down, so you don't even need a table to set this on in order to set it up and work. Now, I usually set it up on a good solid table, if possible, because it's a little bit more sturdy, but let's take the hinges off see what we've got inside. And by the way, this case does have a set of wheels on one end, so it's easy to put it up on its side and pull it around uh, rolling it on the wheels. So, as you can see, CD play or, uh, two CD players on the outsides, mixer in the middle, and there's also this optional item, which I am not currently using, but this will flip on and off, so you can normally store it inside like this and the cover will fit on over top, and you can slide it out, like say you want to slide it up to here, and this can be used as a laptop bench. Um, you can also, if you wanted to, put it on the other way, depending on what you've got for a mixer and that way you get a more of a sliding, more of a tilted base for your laptop. Okay, so the mixer right now, you could see that my uh, laptop stand would not fit on it well, that's because I've got all this stuff underneath. Normally your mixer can sit down more. I've got this piece of padding in here, which allows for the airflow to be a little bit better. Um, it also tilts the mixer towards me when I'm playing, which is handy. There is 
pull-out thing here, which I sometimes use to uh, help increase airflow, because this mixer gets pretty hot when I'm playing. Um, if you had a different piece of equipment in here that needed front loading from a CD or something, um, that's another benefit. And so you can see when I tear this down, I'm able to put CDs in and out of the unit with those things off. So of course my connections on the back of my mixer can all be reached back through here. My CD player stuff on the back can all be reached down through this slotted area. Okay, so very, very durable, sturdy case, not cheap, not cheap at all, very durable and sturdy, very handy to have. This is one of the best investments I've ever made was buying this case, very happy with it. Now as far as the mixer goes, the mixer that you choose to use in your system that's going to vary a lot. I'm not going to make a specific recommendation because th the mixer that you want to use is going to depend on your budget. It's going to be depending on whether or not you will, can afford or want to use two or three or even four channels. Um, depending on your style of playing, you may want a mixer that's designed more for scratching, uh, like some of the Rain mixers, R A N E, or you may want a Pioneer type of mixer like this DJM 600 or, or the newer 800, 900, because those are kind of industry standards in a lot of clubs. Uh, you may want a mixer like an Allen & Heath, like that backup mixer that I showed you, or that I'm about to show you. And the Allen & Heath is a little bit more, based on the inputs that it's got on the back, it's a little bit easier to work with if you're also incorporating live performance stuff, like XLR chords, quarter-inch chords, stuff like that. Whereas the Pioneer ones are a little bit more tailored to equipment like CD players and turntables with line level or phono inputs. So lots of variety in the mixer that you choose to use. And I'll put a link underneath here right now to, um, to point you to another video that I did. It's, it's about mixers, an intro to, to what, do you, what different mixers are used for, how, you know, all the characteristics of using an audio mixer. I will clarify that was one of the very first videos that I ever put together, so the quality is not quite as good as uh, the more recent videos in terms of film quality and, uh, and lighting and stuff like that. Now let's talk about CD players. Um, right now, as I say, I don't usually use a laptop when I'm performing in a mobile setup. Uh, I do sometimes use Ableton, uh, but that's usually if I'm performing in a club or at a festival where there's already a DJ booth stage set up for me. Um, otherwise, with my mobile setup, I'm usually playing off pitch controlled CD players, um, very occasionally off turntables still. Thankfully, vinyl hasn't died entirely. Um, so in my setup, I've got a pair of CDJ2000 CD, pitch controlled CD players uh, from Pioneer. Again, the, the brand that you get is going to depend very much upon your budget. Um, these CDJ2000s are fantastic pieces of equipment. They're also extremely expensive. Uh, when I bought them, they were about $2,200 each. They've come down in price a little bit in the last four years, but not that much. Um, Pioneer does have some other mixers that kind of look like the 2000s on the surface and that have that same feel, a lot of the same performance aspects. Um, but they're a lot cheaper because they don't have some of the um, fancier internal features. So a lot of you, based on your budget, may want to go with a much cheaper um, version of the CDJ line. I don't know. Well, the only thing I would really recommend is that in this day and age, people using physical CDs, that's becoming more and more rare. And it's also getting to be a little bit of a problem because a lot of laptops being sold these days don't have an optical drive, a CD drive, built into them. So it's getting harder for some people to be able to even burn CDs. So these particular CD players will accept a USB key. That's a huge benefit. You don't have to worry about burning CDs. You don't have to worry about carrying CDs. You can put all your music on a smaller source. And realistically, with a USB key that has a lot of uh, memory on it, 
you can carry far, far more songs than you could get even in a, um, in a binder full of CDs. Okay. One other thing you need to look at when you're looking at CD players is some of them, when they play off CD, they will only read audio CDs. Others, more advanced ones, will read data CDs so that you can have all your audio burned onto the CD rather, as, rather than as actual songs that you put into like a car stereo or whatever. It's, it's a data CD, so it would have MP3 files, WAV files, you know, your, your CD could actually have Microsoft documents, PDF files, whatever, because it's a data CD, and you can stick it into the player and the computer will, will read the, uh, the files that are audio-based, AIFF, WAV, MP3. Okay, um, so that might be important to know, but again, USB is your best option. Uh, I do have another video that I'm working on right now that goes into CD players in a lot more depth. I'll put a link down here right now. Also, if you're interested in learning to DJ and you want to be able to beat mix, beat match, uh, I have a separate video and I will, I'll put a link to that. That's separate from my, um, my first CDJ video. One CDJ video is more about the equipment, um, how the features work, and characteristics of the different brands and models. But I've also got the separate one that teaches you more about how to actually beat mix using those CD players. So here's the link to the beat mixing for, uh, video. Anyway, you can pick whichever uh, CD player you want. That's totally up to your budget. But... Uh, and of course you can, if you prefer, uh, you can go with turntables instead, although turntables may not fit into one of these coffin cases. Um, I'll actually show you my turntables next, and you can see I've got different cases for those. You may end up not even wanting to play on CD players or on turntables. You may want to go with purely a laptop-based solution, using something like Mixmeister, Virtual DJ, um, Serato, something like that. Okay, so this is the this is the brains, the central core of my mobile DJ rig. Okay, next up is a pair of turntables. I don't use these at very many events at all these days, to be honest, uh, which is unfortunate because playing on vinyl is fun, and uh, it's more fun than playing off a laptop or playing on CDs. But such is the nature of technology changing. Um, Flight cases for turntables, very, very handy, again. Uh, this one, unfortunately, one of my legs is missing, so I kind of use a, uh, use a book underneath it when I'm using it. And so basically the flight case opens up, and you can remove the cover, and you can play with this uh, right inside its flight case. And of course, you'll have to take the, uh, the cords out, RCA cord, power cord, anyway, pretty standard. Um, I've got a couple videos, um, I'll put a link up to a couple of videos that I've done that are a little bit older. Um, first of all, learning to set up a turntable. This one, admittedly, is very old. It was, uh, it was done probably 10 years ago, so the quality isn't quite as good. Uh, second video learning to beat match with vinyl records. Um, that's pretty pretty recent, I just did that a year ago. And so, link to that one here. Anyway, that's about it. Not too many of you will be using turntables in a mobile setup, so I definitely, unless you're already a vinyl junkie, I would not recommend you worrying that you have to buy turntables or that you have to learn to beat mix on vinyl. That's kind of a specialty area that only a small number of DJs, unfortunately, will be interested in. Okay, this next piece of gear that I carry around is not critical, not mandatory. It's just a safety thing for me. And this is an extra mixer. Because if your mixer dies in the middle of a show, you're in trouble. And like I say, when you're starting out, you're not going to have the budget to be carrying two mixers around. But I do have two. And so I'm always, always going to take it to a gig. Because with some of your other equipment, like your CD players, You've probably got backup sound sources. You may not have a third CD player, but you probably have a laptop, a phone, MP3 player, 
something that in an emergency, if one of your CD players dies during the middle of a set, you can plug in that other sound source and at least you may not have the same quality as what you would have planned for the evening, but at least you'll be able to make noise. Similarly, with the speakers, you've got two speakers, plus you've probably got your booth monitor, so if one of those speakers dies, you're still going to have sound. Not as good, but you'll have sound. Same thing with the bass bins. One dies, you're still going to have sound. Lights, you know, one, two, three of them die. People are going to keep dancing because you've got music. You're going to have extra cables, extra power cords, all sorts of backups. But the one thing most people don't carry, one thing you, you need to replace if it dies in the middle of your set is your mixer. So at some point, if you get to a point where you're doing a lot of professional shows, it doesn't have to be a fancy backup mixer. You can get a cheap $100, very simple two-channel mixer, but there may come a time when your mixer dies during a show and you're dead in the water without a backup. Okay, next let's look at uh, speaker and lighting stands. Okay, I've got a couple I'm going to show you here. This first one, fairly heavy, although it's not a large stand. Um, this one is all metal, and I'll set this up on the floor over there in a second and show you what's going on. But you can maybe see through here, there is the, um, there's a slot and a metal pin, and this is used, instead of just the, the knob for tightening, this is used to help make sure that the system is secure when you're setting things up. Okay, so that's a fairly heavy stand. By comparison, this stand weighs half as much as the other one, and this is a much larger stand. Um, so this is a very lightweight metal uh, and plastic combination. It also has the, uh, the same sort of pins for safety, security. And I'll set one of these up in a second on the floor. And finally we have, this is called a T-bar, lighting T-bar. And basically this, the end of this will fit over top of this. And so when this stand is set up and the T-bar is there, you can use this to hang lights from it. And obviously there's a way to tighten this. We've got some, uh, we've got two tighteners here which use hex keys to tighten them, but they, when you've got them tightened up completely, this bar will not spin around. And of course, there's some, uh, some holes through here in case you're trying to put, um, put bolts through to keep the light from moving, shifting back and forth. And sometimes you won't use the bolt holes, you'll just use a clamp to clip the lights to this T-bar, and then you'll use a safety chain wrapped from the light around to the center to make sure it can't shift out to the end and fall off. So looking at this uh, light stand, you can see that I've got the legs spread out a lot further, and so that's going to be a lot more stability. Now looking up at the top, well actually I guess uh, you should also know that there's usually metal uh, spikes that can go through here to add some uh, reinforcement. These things do have a knob that you can tighten to make sure that this thing can't slide up and down, but this spike through the frame certainly gives it some more stability. Now, looking up here, here's the way that you want to uh, have your lights hung, if possible. First of all, think about the weight of the light. The further a light is out from the center, the more the pole wants to lean. This light does not weigh as much as this light, and so what I'm trying to do is put a balance on this pole so it's a little bit more stable. So this one is closer to the frame, closer to the center of gravity, and to balance it out, because this light doesn't weigh as much, I've got it out a little bit further on the pole. Now, I also have some safety chains here. They're not going to do a whole lot if the entire pole stand turn, uh, falls down, but as far as just shaking, if this shakes a little bit through the night and these lights start sliding off, this safety chain will keep it from sliding off the end. That's the key thing. And sometimes you've got extra bolts and stuff like this, so that bolt would also stop this light from sliding too far, but you know, you want to think about safety. You never know, a dancer might get near one of these, if, especially in a mobile installation. You're not really going to see that in a permanent DJ area. 
but uh, you have to really think about safety. Okay, the next thing to cover is the lighting system that you use. Now, this is an area where there's no real standardization. What you get for lights depends on your personal preferences, depends on your budget, there's no right or wrong. The setup that I have, I was assuming I would be playing events of say 100 to 300 people quite often, but I went with a fairly minimal lighting system. I'm only using four lights total. I'm using two gobos and two laser lights. Okay? I do have a couple other lights that I bring in occasionally for the bigger events, but let's not talk about those um, because this is my basic system that covers 90% of my needs probably. Okay, so the thing with, uh, with lighting is that's something where technology has, well, like with a lot of things in DJing, technology in the last 10 years or so has really improved and really changed the way things are done. So up until around 2000, the only lights that you really got were, um, they were powered by, they were not powered by LED bulbs. They were powered by traditional style bulbs, which of course got very hot. And so it made the lights very hot. The bulbs would burn out easily and they were not cheap to replace, like, you know, $40, $50 generally for a replacement bulb for a light. And if you left a light on for more than two or three hours, quite often the bulb would burn out because of the heat in some, some lights. So you had to be careful with uh, not leaving the lights on all the time, stuff like that. And in moving lights around, they got damaged very easily. But luckily nowadays we have lights that use LED lighting as their basis and they're much much cooler so basically when the light's been running for a couple hours you can grab the light and hold it and it's not going to be hot to your touch um, so less of a fire hazard less of a safety hazard uh, the bulbs burn out far less frequently because they're cool operation now I'll pull one out here's our standard power cord that we use with the uh, light and this one, it's called a gobo, G-O-B-O, -O. and basically what happens is the light is in here and shines up this way to hit this mirror. There's a little rotating disc inside that the light passes through, and that disc has different colors and different patterns. So as it rotates, you'll get a different image coming up and hitting the mirror. And then the mirror reflects it out onto the dance floor, and this mirror will shake around very frequently all over the place as the uh, you can either have it timed to an external controller or there's an internal microphone so it shifts every time it hears a loud change in the music so basically every time the kick drum hits or something like this it can shift around and make the light flash now I'll, I'll set up a I'll do a quick video shot of what it looks like when it's running but the only other thing I'd like to point out is these ones usually have a cover that you can put on this for when it's being transported and obviously with this mirror assembly it's very fragile so make sure you don't lose these covers don't lose the little screws that hold the covers on and make sure that um, you always cover them up when you're transporting them okay now the other thing that's important here I mentioned having a safety chain so this chain basically the way it would work is that this light, let's say that it was hanging on a lighting rig, okay, so here's the clamp, the pole is going through here, and this screw would tighten up and make sure it's tight on that lighting rack, and then you could take your, take your safety cable, loop it through, and then loop the other end around the T-bar, clamp it into place, and that way, even if for some reason it started shaking and pulling, it can't go out to the end of the T-bar and fall down on the floor and hurt somebody. Okay, so these are my two gobos. Let's look at the lasers next. Okay, so my two gobos, they were a matched set. They do exactly the same thing, but with my lasers, I got two different lasers. So the first one, this one is called the Galaxian Sky. Um, they're very low heat, um, but you're probably, it's probably not healthy for you to be staring into them directly so the laser is hitting your eye. I'm sure that's not good for your eyes. 
Um, but when it's moving on the dance floor, the laser is constantly shooting everywhere, flashing around at, you know, it's probably shifting position tens of thousands of times per second, basically. So even if someone was trying to stare into it directly from a certain spot on the dance floor, it's not really going to, they're not at a safety risk because the laser keeps moving away from their eye. Okay, so same sort of deal here. There's a laser inside underneath this mirror. It shoots up, hits one mirror. That mirror reflects the light over onto this one. And that reflects it onto this one and shoots it out to the crowd. And so with the lasers shifting around, you'll get a variable pattern out on the dance floor. Okay? So the pattern, one of these two lasers does a wavy line pattern and that shimmers and moves around. And the other one does a pattern of a field of bright dots that kind of evolves and moves around. Okay, so here's our Galaxian 3D. There's the back end, power switch, um, power. This is uh, XLR, this is not for microphones, this is for uh, a DMX controller, so you can, you can do some programming on the light. There's all sorts of programming options on this light, but again, I run it the same way as my Gobos. I just let the um, I just let it go on a on a specific pattern, uh, and there's the output fields for the two lasers. I guess that's all there is to it. The uh, the two lasers and the two gobos. Uh, the price on dance floor lighting has come down significantly in the last ten years. These units are only about. 300 to 400 dollars a piece at the moment in US dollars and that's coming down a little bit so you'll probably see them even a bit cheaper um, in some ways you pay you get what you pay for so you can get more expensive laser lights and stuff like this but I find these two are actually really really quite versatile and I'm very pleased with my two gobos also and of course it's nice to have some sort of protective carry, carrying case now I went with a soft case for each of them, uh, which is maybe not as uh, wise as having a hard case to protect them from getting crushed, but obviously with my lights I'm extremely careful about where I set them down and make sure things don't land on them, and I'm very careful when I'm transporting them um, because that case is not going to totally protect them. Okay, for my next piece of equipment, uh, it's actually three pieces of equipment that I use together as a unit. Um, these are an EQ equalizer, a compressor, and a crossover. Now, this stuff, when you're starting out, it's not critical if you have this right away, especially if you're playing smaller events, if you're playing events of maybe 100 people or so at the most. Once you start getting into setups with bigger rooms where you're really pushing your system, like say you have the same two tops that I have, same two subs, um, you're going to probably want this because it's going to improve your sound quality in the long run. Um, the EQ is going to let you isolate and get rid of certain frequencies that may cause problems in uh, the setting that you're in. You know, for instance, maybe I'm playing in a cafeteria, it's got a tile ceiling, and for some reason, the, uh, the sound coming through at, th at about 315 hertz is making all the ceiling tiles shake badly and that's not, not good if people are hearing the ceiling tiles over top of the music. So, in a case like that, before the event starts, I'll have, I'll have run the, the whole system at full volume for a few minutes to double check the sound quality. Hopefully I'll have noticed those shaking ceil ceiling tiles and I'll be able to play with the EQ and drop out the certain frequencies that are causing the vibrations in the ceiling and maybe eliminate the problem. Okay, again, not critical if you're going with a very small system and if you're on a budget when you're starting up. But I'll describe this anyway because it's, uh, it's very useful. So, once again, I have a carrying case. Always important to have carrying cases. And for this one, the, um, there's a port on the back so you can see to get out all your wiring and all your connections. So that's handy. Um, these three pieces of equipment, you know, I always have them right beside each other 
and so I wouldn't want to pair them separately. So let's take a look at what we've got. I won't go into these in a lot of detail. Um, for starters, I feed my signal first into a 30 channel equalizer, and this is, or sorry, a 30 band equalizer. And this has actually two separate channels. So if I wanted to, I could put my left side going through one equalizer and my right side going through the other equalizer and EQ them separately. I could also, I guess in theory, put my tops through one side and my subs through another. Um, who knows? Uh, it depends on your setup, what you want to do. And basically, this gives you all kinds of uh, different EQ bands, so it's really possible... I guess I should have left that the way it was. Um, only because... Oh yeah, here's a good example. Okay, so here at the 315 band, you can see I've got the um, those that frequency band cut quite a bit um, because I was trying to isolate a certain problem the last place that I played. Okay, so then from the EQ, and, and also I guess at some point, I'm going to, um, I'll do videos that go into the EQ in a lot more depth, into the compressor in a lot more depth, and into the crossover in a lot more depth. For now, you probably don't need those right, right at this moment. Um, so once the signal comes out of the equalizer, I'm going into my Alesis 3630 compressor. Um, there's a lot of different EQ brands and models out there, and I don't really have a preference for any of them. When it comes to compressors, the Alesis 3630 is awesome. It's a, it's a very popular one in the industry, so look for that one if you can get it. That's, that's my recommendation. Anyway, the compressor, if you don't know what a compressor does, basically you set a threshold in your signal level, and anything, any sound coming through the system that's below that volume, below that threshold level, is going to pass through with no problems. Anything above that threshold is going to get compressed, so the volume will be squished. And that, the amount that it gets compressed, you can vary that. It's, there's a thing called a ratio, and so you can cut it in half, you can cut it into a third, you can cut it into a tenth of its previous volume. Okay, so maybe I've got the threshold set at negative 20 decibels, and everything above negative 20 is going to get compressed. So if I had, say, um, say I had a ratio of 5, that means the audio above the negative 20 will get compressed to one-fifth of what it used to be. And so anything, say you've got stuff that goes right up to zero decibels, then that's 20 above the threshold. That'll be cut to one-fifth of what it used to be, or to a range of 4 decibels, so your peak is only going to go up to minus 16 now instead of all the way up to zero. Okay, um, Compression is a very complicated topic. Uh, it takes a lot of people a little while to wrap their heads around it. So I'm going to put a link right now to another video that I did for DJ Mixing, which has gotten quite a bit of positive feedback as being a good way to explain compression. Anyway, the point of having the compressor, of course, is that if something goes wrong, you get a um, you get electrical short that goes through the system, something like that, or all of a sudden you get a song that the volume's way up too loud. That compressor will kind of chop that signal, so you don't have as much signal going out to your crossover and to your speakers. Which means if you get a sudden burst of very loud signal, it's not going to get through to your speakers. It's not going to damage your speakers, and it's not going to um, really scare the people out on the dance floor. Okay, so that's why a compressor is useful. It protects your equipment, protects your speakers. And finally, the crossover at the bottom. Um, the crossover is used to split the signal up and route it uh, more efficiently to your bass bins and to your tops. And um, it'll, make the, it'll make the amps inside your speakers work a little bit less hard and basically it'll improve the quality of your sound and there's all kinds of settings on the, on the uh, crossover to determine where the frequency cutoffs and stuff like that are before going into the different equipment. Okay, So I'll also, when I get a chance to do a video about crossovers, 
I will put a link to that right here so you can check that out in more detail if you are interested. So, I'd like to say these three pieces of equipment are certainly not mandatory when you're starting out, but in the long term, if you're going to do a pro setup, professional setup, um, budget for them and learn how they work and get some. Okay, so let's start going through some of the smaller stuff. Now, I mentioned at the start of the video that I would put my list online under the YouTube video. That's kind of my inventory sheet, um, you know, listing all the different stuff that I carry around. Well, I've got a couple bins like this, so let's cover what's in the power bin first. Okay, we'll start off. We have the, um, the power bar. Now, this one has a, it's a UPS, uninterrupted power supply, so it's got a battery backup in it. That one is critical, very critical, very, very important to have one of those. Um, what you're going to want to do is you're going to plug your mixer and your two CD players and at least one of your two tops, your two main speakers, into this. Because if the power goes out, then at least you still have a way, your, your music doesn't die, you still have a way of getting noise out to the crowd, which isn't necessarily uh, important in terms of DJing, but it is important in terms of being able to pick up your microphone and talk to the crowd and let them know what's going on. Okay? And you may think, you know, what's the odds of the power going out? I have seen the power go out at so many shows, it's unbelievable. And most of the time it's not because of the, uh, the local regional power system. Usually, it's because the equipment that you're using plugged into the building's power supply blows fuses, pops circuit breakers, whatever, and uh, it's unbelievable how many times I've seen this, how many shows, like probably one in five shows. It wouldn't surprise me if there were that many. Um, so yeah, so make sure you've got that battery backup, power system, mixer, absolutely for sure, at least one speaker, absolutely for sure, and probably, probably your CD players, just in case, because if the power does go out and you lose everything, um, you may want to make an announcement and then put some music on quietly, tell the people, listen, we've just lost power, we must have blown some fuses. Um, it, it, you'll react differently to the situation. Like, say you're inside an event at night and the power blows that's supplying the DJ booth that you've set up but you can still see lights on in other parts of the building, then you know it's not the power of the entire local area. So you're not gonna probably evacuate the, uh, the building, the venue. You're probably gonna get on the mic, make an announcement and say, listen, we just blew the, uh, just blew the fuses. Give us a couple minutes. We'll get the lights back, our, our dance lights back on shortly. We'll get the rest of our speakers back on shor shortly, but I will keep the music going. Unfortunately, it'll be a reduced volume here for the next few minutes, but bear with us. And then you could keep playing music at a slightly reduced volume. Crowd's happy, so it's not a major interruption. However, if you look around and it's the entire grid that has uh, gone offline, which isn't very often, then at least you've got the microphone, you can kill the music and say, listen, we may, uh, we may want to evacuate the building, get everyone to go outside until we uh, decide what's, what's happening here. Okay, so that's the main thing. Next thing, you're going to want a couple of other power bars, and it's good to make sure that these have some sort of surge protection in them, because your equipment is valuable, and it's expensive, and you don't want a bad power grid to send some sort of uh, surge, power surge through the system and roast your mixer or CD players. Next, um, fire extinguisher. Okay, I don't normally carry a fire extinguisher with me. Uh, if you're at an outdoor event, it's probably not that important that you have a fire extinguisher. Uh, if you're inside a building, it might be very useful to have one. But usually what I do, I don't carry one. What I'll do is once I'm set up, I'll take a look around the uh, building, the club, the cafeteria, whatever it is, and figure out where the fire extinguishers are, just in case. I've never had to use one, but you never know. Uh, power cords. This is the next thing that's important. Now, I've only got two here, and that's because I've got a second bin over there with all the rest of them. But, you should have some heavy-duty power cords, and you want probably... 
I have eight of these longer 30 meter cords. Um, that's 100 feet for people in the US. Okay. Eight of the long ones. And then for a shorter 15 meter cord or a 50 foot cord, I have four of those. And quite often you won't use most of those, but depending where you're set up, your power supply may be quite a distance away. Also, you don't want to, um, let's say your power supply is quite a ways away, you don't want to carry all the power for your entire system through one or two cords directly because something that's going to be important is going back to the issue of blowing uh, fuses, popping circuits. You want to try and split your power uh, draw into as many sources as possible on different plugs because you're far less likely to blow, you know, blow a fuse if you have less power on the outlet. So what I'll often try to do is run as many as four different power cords, power leads into my, uh, into my work area. And so I'll put one set of speakers on one cord, one set of speakers on a second cord, I'll put all my lighting assemblies on a third cord, and then the fourth cord will be my core uh, system. So my mixer, CD players, turntables if I have them, EQ, compressor, um, all that sort of stuff. Okay, next um, I have four short cords, and these ones are all um, like five meters long, 15 feet. I prefer, very much prefer, to have this kind of, a, of, of an end on all my power cords. Now unfortunately, I bought qu quite a few of these a few years ago before these were very common, and before I realized how useful they are. Uh, instead of an end with just a single single plug, it's nice to get one with three different outlet sockets, and it's very nice to get one with this indicator light to show that there's power coming through the cord. You have no idea how helpful that is in a dark situation when you're trying to figure out why you're not getting power. Okay, next up, I have these. Now, this is your standard power cord, which in uh, North America looks like that at one end, like that at both ends. Okay, so obviously in different areas um, you're going to have different types of plugs, but I've got a lot of these. You can see I've actually got 20 of these. Now, I don't know why I have so many. I just seem to have collected them over the years. But, you will need quite a few. I'm going to say that you're probably going to need at least 10. Because thinking about my setup, I need two to power my two subwoofers. I need four to power my four lights, or more if I've got a few of my extra lights here. I need two to power my EQ and my um, compressor. So there's eight at least. Um, yeah, so you're going to need a lot of those. I also carry gaff tape. And this is similar to duct tape, except this is way better because this stuff, um, if you use duct tape to hold cords down on carpet or on tiles or against walls, duct tape is going to rip um, rip paint off walls, it's going to leave residue on the floors. However, gaffing tape is professional theater tape and you know it works like duct tape but it doesn't leave that residue so it's much better for the uh, for the venue. Uh, I have an extra power cord for my CD players in case one of those dies. That's probably not something that you're going to use very frequently. I have a couple of these extra power splitter things I don't use those very often. Typically my power splits are coming from my, um, my power bars or from my extension cords that have three plugs on the end. I have, uh, I carry some extra colored electrical tape and you may have noticed that all my cords have, uh, have yellow and green duct tape at each end. And that's because sometimes, sometimes I'm working with um, with other other suppliers, with other other people doing sound, and cords tend to get mixed together occasionally. And when you do, you want a way to identify which ones are yours. <clears throat> and if you've got the the colored electrical tape on them, there's no uh, no question. I also have a lot of these um, Velcro um, cable straps, which are nice to hold everything together. 
keep your stuff organized. I also have for the, uh, for the bigger extension cords, I have these nice little plastic things called um, cable cuffs, which hold uh, which hold the cable together very easily. Okay, and then finally, the last thing in my power bin is going to be some extra flashlights uh, and batteries. Now these are uh, old style traditional flashlights. You can now get um, you can get a package of LED flashlights for like 20 bucks that probably has six or seven flashlights in it and that's nice because it's always good to have a couple around. If you're playing in a very dark venue sometimes you might need to um, use it to see certain things on your mixer. Um, it's always good to have a a small desk lamp with a First of all, make sure it's got a bulb that stays very cool. Um, so I would recommend an LED light bulb, not a traditional incandescent or not one of those compact fluorescents. Um, the compact fluorescents are cool, but they break easily. So LED light bulb, small desk lamp with a clamp on it, and that's going to help you see your mixer if you're performing in a dark venue. That's very, very useful. Okay, so basically that's my power bin. Let's move on to the signals cords bin. Okay, so next let's move on to our bin for all of our cables, connectors, and cords. For starters, I have two uh, cords here. These are basically quarter inch mono ends on each side. You'll see this is a very thick cable. This is kind of the same as a guitar patch cord, but it's not. It's actually a speaker cable. Now, with um, I talked earlier about having uh, powered versus non-powered, unpowered speakers. Uh, basically, the stuff that I use is all powered, so I don't really need these. This type of cord would normally be used uh, if you've got unpowered speakers and you're coming out from an external amplifier going into your speaker. Uh, however, I do carry these because sometimes I'm working in installations with other, um, with other production companies, with other equipment, and I found it is nice, it's handy to have two of those uh, just in case. You never know when you might need one or when someone you're working with might need one. Now, the other thing too, I think earlier when I was talking about speakers, I talked about the difference between powered and unpowered speakers. Uh, I don't believe I covered active versus passive speakers. And this is an interesting topic because basically a lot of people when they're referring to an active speaker they mean a powered speaker. And when they're referring to a passive speaker they're referring to an unpowered speaker that needs an external amp. It's a bit of a tricky distinction because those things are not technically quite equivalent. Um, how do I explain this? Um, basically, active or passive doesn't refer to the speaker unit as a whole. It refers to the crossover within the speaker. So it's possible to have um, a system where you have, a, where it's called a passive speaker system, where there is no power going specifically to supply the crossover and amplification within the system. What happens instead, it's the actual signal that supplies its own power. Um, basically, it, the way it works is the signal will be running through inductors and capacitors, and I, f I forget exactly how this works. Um, I think a capacitor only allows higher frequencies to pass um, at certain signal strengths and an inductor only allows lower frequencies to pass so there's not necessarily a powered crossover there's just this circuitry and as the signal goes in only parts of the signal will get through to different types of speakers depending on whether you're talking about the lower or the treble um, frequencies. Anyway, so it's not really critical at all that you know this and obviously I don't know the exact specifics offhand, but basically that's what active versus, versus passive means. For the most part, you can assume that if someone's talking about active speakers, they mean powered. 
and if they're talking about passive, they mean unpowered, even though technically that is not correct. And if you ever get into um, proper studio engineering uh, courses and stuff like that, you'll learn the exact difference. It'll make more sense than what I've just said. Okay, next, I have a dozen patch cords here. These are basically what you think of when you think guitar patch cord. So, quarter inch, male, mono, output, plug at each end, okay? And I don't really use any of those when it comes to DJing, but some of those are useful in a live sound situation, and occasionally I use my gear for stuff other than just a DJ, <coughs> other than just a DJ gig, where I'm working with live instruments and stuff like that. So that's why I have those. Uh, you probably do not need a dozen of those. You probably, even if you're in a situation where you are doing live sound stuff, uh, you probably only need five or six, I would say. Next, XLR cords. So. XLR cords have what is known as a female end and they have what is known as a male end and it's the pins, not the overall plug, which is why they got the name, that's why male, because it has the pin that inserts and the female has the receptacle. Any XLR cord can plug into itself. The reason that's useful is because you can string XLR cords together. You can use several. Now, with line level signals, if you're talking about a standard quarter inch cord, this is called also a high impedance cord. And high impedance means there's a lot of resistance. So, you will not see this type of cord that is very long, usually. Um, going from a guitar into a direct box, into a DI box, or into an amplifier, you're usually looking at cords that are 10 to 25 feet long, 3 to three to 8 meters maybe. Okay, and that's because signal quality degrades quickly the longer the cord goes. An XLR cord is known as a low impedance cord, or a low Z, and these, there's not a lot of signal loss as it travels along the cord. So I think in my experience, you can generally run a series of XLR cords a long distance. Like I'm talking 150 to 300 meters, which is 500 to 1,000 feet, um, before you start really experience, experiencing significant signal loss. So if for some reason you're, say you're working an outdoor event, you've got a field and you've got a long way to run, XLR cords are going to make it work for you. So, they can patch together. Now, obviously, if you're doing a long run, having less connections is better. So, in my setup, I have four of these cords that are 30 meters long, or about 100 feet. And I have eight of these cords that are shorter, that are about 15 meters long, or... Um, 30 feet, 50 feet, 25 feet, I don't know how long they are, actually. Uh, 15 meters is 50 feet, yep. Uh, I also have some shorter ones that are 20 or 25 feet long. So, in total, I have 20 XLR cords here. You will not need that many, but you will definitely need several because you'll be running depending on what type of mixer you have and what your main outputs are from your mixer. But with my Pioneer DJM mixer, I'm coming out of XLR and going to my, um, to my crossover, to that whole system, uh, EQ, compressor, crossover, going out to my bins, to my tops, all of that is done with XLR cords. So even if you're not having to, even if they're close and you're not having to patch two of them together, you're going to need probably eight, I'd say, at least. So anyway, that's why I have tons of them. And they do break fairly often internally and you'll lose your signal. So be prepared to throw out one of those cords that doesn't work anymore, probably every half dozen shows easily. Now, what's left? Well, this is the odds and ends. I have a microphone. 
I have some standard RCA cords. Okay, and so when I talking about RCA, obviously I mean these standard RCA phono connectors, and most of them are paired cords, which means you've got two of them together in one cord. I do have a couple that are for a single line, uh, and that's... <sighs> when would you want one of those? Let's say that you've actually got two booth monitors, one on each side, and from your booth monitor output on your mixer, you may want to send a cord in each direction, a mono signal. So you've got a mono signal going to your left, a mono signal going to your right. I also have quite a few of these adapters that go female RCA to male quarter inch mono to go onto the ends of RCA cords. Always useful to have those, have half a dozen of those. Let's see what I have next. I have some. Ah, yes. I have a couple of headphone extender cords. I have this short one, so it plugs into your headphone <coughs> headphone port on your mixer, and then you can plug your headphones into this, which means you can step away a little bit further away from your mixer. And I have a long one here, which is about uh, probably 8 meters long. I also have a headphone extender. Uh, sorry, headphone splitter. And what this does, you can see it's stereo because it's got the two lines instead of the uh, mono. Okay, so there's a mono and there's a stereo. So basically, this headphone splitter plugs into my headphone port and then I can plug two sets of headphones in. And that's useful when you've got two, J's, two DJs working together. Okay, next I have some odds and ends. Um, okay, this cord is a very important one, very commonly used one. This goes from 8th inch stereo male to RCA paired. And the reason for this is this will let you plug in a phone, a tablet, a laptop, MP3 player, anything like that into your mixer because the male 8th inch stereo goes into your headphone port on your laptop or your headphone jack on your iPod, your phone, whatever, and then these will go into one of your channel inputs on your DJ mixer. So it's good to have a couple of those, or three. Uh, and then I've got a couple cords which I very rarely use, very rarely use, but they are good when uh, in certain limited situations. So for instance, here I've got one that adapts from a paired male RCA phono to a paired XLR male. And then I have two more cords that are almost exactly the same as that last one, except they are separated, and so each one is a single cord instead of the two of them being attached together. And then I have four of these cords, and basically what these are is one end is a female XLR, and the other end is <coughs> male quarter inch um, mono. And so sometimes that's good when adapting from certain mixers to certain other amplifiers, certain other pieces of equipment. Now in my own current system, I don't need, the, need those, but again, I sometimes work with other production companies and we have to uh, be able to have certain types of gear or work with, with each other that I'm not uh, typically using. Okay, so that basically is my signal cord bin. Okay, finally, let's go into the toolboxes. I have two toolkits, two toolboxes. Uh, I did not list everything in these two boxes out on my inventory page. So this is something that you might want to think about is starting to build a toolkit of your own. Um, the reason I didn't list the contents of this on my inventory page is because I usually don't have to tap into these, but it's nice to have them. So let me show you what exactly I have. I have some cords, I have a uh, video camera, and 
and amount. I have a lot of DNC ends. I've got some wire. I've got some <coughs> snips. I have some duct tape, some more BNC connectors. I have a set of small screwdrivers, small tools for repairs, a couple more needle nose pliers, um, a crimper for cable ends, a monkey wrench, another flashlight, lots of wire, some spare bulbs, spare fuses, lots of uh, cable ties. Lots of adapters, electrical ends. So, obviously, a lot of this stuff is not going to be needed when we're doing a normal show. A lot of stuff in this kit is actually used when I'm doing video security camera installations and stuff like that. But some of these tools are useful if you have to fix something on the fly when you're on the road. In this case, in this case we have stuff that's a little bit more frequently used. A clipboard. It's nice to have a clipboard and some paper and pens for writing down requests. We have a staple gun, lots of cable ties, extra batteries for flashlights, all kinds of electrical tape of various colors. We have some pliers, some tie strips adjustable wrench. We have an SPL meter, which lets you know what the volume is, just in case someone's saying that your volume is too loud. We have extra security ties, cable ties for your lighting. I have lots of screwdrivers, more batteries, carabiners, tons of screwdrivers, tons Tons and tons of adapters, like your little barrel connectors to extend an RCA setup, um, your RCA female to quarter inch male. I've got a dozen of those in here. I've got hex keys. I have toothpaste, extra cable cuffs, uh, deodorant. I have a, um, a meter, a tester, electrical tester. So you can see. Generally, I have a whole lot of odds and ends that probably you won't normally need to use during a show, but, you know, the more stuff that you have, the more likely you are going to want it with you just in case something happens, because there's nothing worse than getting to a venue and all of a sudden thinking, oh man, I wish I had a pair of wire cutters and a piece of wire, and you know you've got them at home and you don't have them with you. Okay, I think that's about it for the equipment that I carry around with me. So I want to give you an example of what uh, you might encounter in a typical installation. So here's all my gear piled up on the floor before I set up, and it pretty much fills a half-ton truck. And here's a short while later, a couple hours later actually, uh, everything's already set up and we're testing the system. Lights are already in place running. Music is actually running in the background. And uh, you can see that we've got the speakers set up everything in theory is ready to go and so we're just letting the music run qui quietly for a while making sure that we don't have any problems with uh, circuits blowing fuses uh, fuses blowing and uh, it's a fairly it's a little bit larger than a small hall um, it, it could hold 250 people I guess if we needed to and here's uh, behind the DJ booth setup uh, you can see my booth monitor right here. And then you can see one of the mains, right side main, on top of the base bin. And then you can see my coffin case with the CD players and with the mixer all running. And here I've got the laptop, uh, just listening to some different music actually. And so that's what I've got. Okay, so there you go. There's all the gear that I use in my own personal mobile DJ setup. Um, I put together a spreadsheet uh, using Microsoft Excel. You can find the link to it underneath in the text description underneath the YouTube video. Uh, there's also a PDF version if you don't have Excel. And basically it lists all the different uh, items that I keep and carry around with me in the, uh, in the mobile rig, except 
I only mentioned one microphone. I actually have two microphones. I have a wireless microphone too, which, which doesn't get used very often, but it's useful at weddings and stuff like that. Anyway, so I've got the spreadsheet online. If you want to download it, download it and tailor it to meet your own needs, please go ahead, feel free. Um, <clears throat> I've got a list of how many of each item that you might need, and there's a little checkbox thing on the left side. I also, uh, although these prices will not be accurate for most of you uh, in different countries, uh, because pricing is different in different countries, and also because a lot of the equipment you might do a substitution, use a different mixer than me, stuff like that. But at least I have it all set up there so that you can figure out the value of your current system, which is good for insurance purposes, or if you're starting out and you're about to build a system, you've got an idea of what you need to budget for, how much money you have to have saved, or if you're going to a bank for a loan, you'll need a business plan, and this at least will give you a good idea um, in terms of budgeting for your business plan of what uh, the bank is going to look at, you know, have you done your research, whatever, what do you need and why do you need it. Okay, so feel free to download that. <clears throat> Basically, I think after looking, after going through all this so far, if you're still listening, you've realized that mobile, <clears throat> mobile DJing is a huge commitment. It's a very tough job. It's the hardest DJ job there is um, because of the versatility that's needed. So if you were debating doing this, uh, I suspect that this video has scared some of you off and that's probably a very good thing because you don't want to get into something where you get way over your head. Mobile DJing, if you're going to do this, it's not the sort of job that you want to do for just two or three years. So if you're thinking about doing this, you better ask yourself, am I ready to commit to this for several years? Because if you're going to spend $20,000 almost on a sound system, then it's going to take you a lot of shows over a couple of years to pay that off, okay? A van or a truck, maybe not such a bad investment because you'll still be able to use it or you'll be able to resell it easily. DJ equipment, the resale values on that aren't, aren't always great, and so if you you invest all this money, do a couple shows and decide, no, this isn't for you, you're going to lose a little bit of money or a lot of money on reselling that stuff, okay? So be absolutely sure that you're going to commit to this for a couple years if you're going to do this. And also, make sure that you've got some money in the bank as a reserve because at the start, you're not going to get a lot of shows and you're still going to have to live. Pay rent, pay for groceries, pay for clothing, stuff like that. So, so be prepared for, uh, for a lean year or so at the very beginning. Um, also, in addition to the money for the gear and for making sure you can survive for a year or so, you've got to have several thousand dollars up front for the business end of thing, for your licenses, for your insurance, for some initial marketing. Um, so you're looking at like probably at least five thousand dollars right off the bat. So remember that when you're trying to write, do, do your own business plan and do some planning. You're also going to have to know a lot about music. So if I've gone through all this stuff and this is still exciting to you and you want to go ahead with it, but you have no experience as a DJ, then you might have a lot to learn in that respect too. Now, if you're serious about becoming a mobile DJ professional, starting your own business, if you don't have a lot of experience doing this stuff already, here's a bit of advice that you might want to consider. You may want to try going and working for another company for a year or two. Um, that could be a little bit tricky if you're, work, if you're in a smaller community. You go to work for a company for a couple of years and then you branch out and start your own that's competing with them. Um, you know, in a small market that could be kind of tricky. But in a big city, maybe not such a big, big deal. Okay, and that's going to give you the practice to build some confidence, uh, to make sure you know how to DJ well. It's going to give you an idea of the headaches and pitfalls and challenges and obstacles that you have to overcome on a day-to-day -day basis when you're doing shows. And it's going to let you get all this experience and education without having to put the upfront money into the equipment. Okay, so that's something you should definitely consider. Um, other than that, my only real advice is be professional, 
be flexible, don't undersell yourself on the price, and do more research. What I've talked about here in this video, it seems like a lot of info, but all I tried to do was give you an overview of what you're getting yourself into. There's much more to mobile DJing than I have talked about in this video. And I discovered some books that I own that I wish I'd read before I filmed the rest of this, but I just skimmed over these this afternoon. Two books here, brand new. Uh, both of them by Stacy Zeman, and one is the Mobile DJ Handbook, and the other is Sales and Marketing Handbook. I looked through the uh, table of contents in these this afternoon and just skimmed through them really quickly. A lot of good info in here, okay? This, these two books go into some of the stuff that I just barely briefly touched on, especially the business end of it. The thinking about marketing, thinking about business aspects, thinking about contracts, thinking about attracting clients. Those two books go into that in, uh, in a lot of detail. So I highly recommend you go out and try and find those. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> hopefully this video has given you uh, an idea of what you're getting yourself into. And if you're still interested in doing it after all my cautions and realizing how involved it is, then that's awesome. Then you're probably a good person to do it. So give it a shot. Okay, thanks for watching this video. I've got a lot of other DJ-related videos and, and stuff related to music production, all sorts of stuff, on my main website. I'm going to put a link in just a second that uh, lets you see a list of all my videos in order. But in the meantime, if you found this to be useful, this video, I'd love it if you shared it with anyone that you know might be interested. You know, email it to a friend, post it on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, whatever. And also, if you're a Twitter user and you want to learn more about some of the other upcoming videos I've got coming, you can follow me at DJ Bolivia. Okay? Thanks for watching.